Hi, I'm Vinnie Jones and this is my show. If you like football, you're in the right place. Have a little look at this lineup for tonight. But football has always been relatively well paid in comparison with Joe Public. But these lads behind us, the ones who make it, are going to be earning 10 grand a week. Do you ever envy them that? Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Today I'm in London with everybody. In fact, we've got a real mixture here today. I've got Arsenal, Wimbledon, QPR, West Ham, Chelsea and Tottenham who all love each other. It's a miracle we've got you all sitting at the same table. During the week, he's a headmaster, but at the weekend, he's the Premiership's man in black. It is, of course, David Elwood. Obviously, we're all pissed heads in the cap. He's going for 90 minutes, at least. What's going wrong, yeah! Who said footballers earn all the money in the game? This little pad here, with Alan Smith sitting here just having a nice drink of water. Alan, nice to see you. Yeah, and you, Vinny. Good to see you. How's things going? Yeah, fine, you know, it can't be bad, can it? We're sitting here today, weather's out there, pool's good. Nice Women. to see the neighbours round. Yeah, very nice. Women look quite good as well, so that's, uh, you know, a pleasant place to come. It is, yeah. Now, what's happening? You's, you've been doing your manager bit, Crystal Palace, and down at... Um, Wickham. Wickham. Yeah. How's, it, how's your life changed now? Well, I've got more time to myself, that's certain. Seeing me golf and my tennis have improved. And I think as a manager, there's no doubt about it, you, you spend a lot of time looking after everybody else. That's the truth of it, you know, phone calls. Yeah. And, you know, I've probably been doing it now for 22 years as a manager from Dulwich Hamlet to Wimbledon. So I quite enjoy sometimes having a little bit of time with my own wife and kids who I've probably neglected. If it'd be Do they get neglected? Out. Do they get...? Oh, without any doubt. You know, both my sons now are 21, 22 now. I'd honestly say I didn't really grow up with them. And I've really enjoyed, you know, over this last year, spending a bit of time with them, going for a pint, playing a bit of golf with them, which I didn't really do when they were younger. Because you know what it's like, you're away at Christmas, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. You're, you know, you spend a lot of time away. You know you when you're at international duty, you're away in the summer. It's like it's a 10 months of the year job. And when you get into that management, you've got 30 other children to look after as well. Does that add, up, does that add to the pressure, you know, being away from the family? I mean, I mean, football's all about results, isn't it? Doing yeah. well, you know, and, and then you're either doing well or you're doing bad, aren't you? And then if you're doing bad, you get pressures because you think, oh, I'm going to get the sack. What is, what, where do the pressures come? Is it because you're worried, of, like, you're going to lose your income or what is it? Yeah, what is I, I never really worried about that too much, to be fair. I think I was a little bit luckier than a lot because, you know, I was fairly self-sufficient, so I never really worried about, you know, the money side of it. I mean, I did it because I wanted to do well. The money didn't really come into it. And I, you know, I really got a lot of pleasure, you know, out of, you know, people like Chris Armstrong and Ian Wright and Gareth Southgate. When I went on to play for England and I produced, you know, I helped produce them, you don't produce them, but I've done a little bit. I really enjoyed that. I think the pressures are a lot if, you know, you're, you're a football manager in the second and third division earning 50 grand a year, you're out 12 hours a day, you know, your wife's nagging you because you haven't had a new dross and you don't come home for a meal. I think yeah. that's pressure. And, you know, you've got pressures in the Premier League, obviously, because it's about results. And in our business, everybody thinks they can be a football manager. That's the sure, truth yeah, of it. Sure. What is, what is the difference between being, like, say, manager at Chelsea and manager at Wickham? Well, I think just the daily press coverage every day, you know, that's the difference. I mean, and when I was at Crystal Palace, for instance, every player I had at Palace had an agent. And rightly so. I mean, players have got to be advised. That wasn't a problem. Whereas at Wickham, I don't think any of the players had agents. But that day-to-day pressure of the press always on to you, newspapers at the training but ground. But Rude Hullet don't go up and down the motorway looking at players at Scarborough and Cardiff. Now, I don't think he even knows where Scarborough is, no, does he? I shouldn't that's have what I'm that. saying. But I mean, yeah. when, I mean, when I went to Wimbledon, that, that's all Dave Bassett used to do. Yeah. But, but you, you'd have to do that at Wickham. Yeah. You'd have to oh, do that any day. And at Palace, I mean, one knows, make sure you got out at night and watch games. But don't you think that's that new breed of manager that probably we will have coming in, in a way? He'll be the figurehead. Yeah. He'll date the training from 10 till... Uh, uh, 10 till 2 o'clock, and then he go in. Arsene Wenger, I'm sure he doesn't go up to Rochdale and Halifax. <laughs> he comes in and takes the training, and he's got people that are run about and do the work for him, and probably there's a lot of them in that. So where are going to be, you know, like the Ian Wrights, Vinnie Jones is from non-league, that's, that's not going to happen unless they go into, you know, unless Alan Smith or Dave Bassett will choke in their season. No, that's right. I think, you know, nobody's going to be going down to Wilson like they did for you. That's a certainty. And that's why we've got this new breed of footballer coming in almost that, you know, comes straight into it. He's not a realist. And quite often footballers are accused of not being in the, in the real world. And as you say, the writers and yourself, you had different upbringings. So I think he was pleased to come into it. 
I think there are still a lot of players out there playing on the parks that can come into the game. There's no doubt about that. But I think there's also a new breed of footballer, isn't there? But if someone, say someone went to Hullet and said, oh, I was down um, watching Wildstone the other day and they've got a brilliant centre forward. Would he laugh or just say, well, don't worry, I've got someone coming from Italy anyway. You know, would he? I don't think he'd want to know is the truth of it, Benny. I think he would want a more high-profile player. Would that and even get to him, that someone's seen a decent player? I suspect not. The truth is they've probably got their own chief scout. I think today he will take the view. He's going to be there for two or three years and he'll be gone somewhere else, like Arsene Wenger. Well, you know, they, they, yeah. Like the coaches in Europe, they only stay at a club one or two years. Whereas your Dave Bassett's of this world and your Joe Kinnear's of this world have said, look, we're going to be at a club. Like Joe's been there eight years and he's, he knew when he was a reserve team manager that he wanted to bring these kids through. As I say, it's a, it's a different animal we're breeding now. I'm not what, saying it's worse, by the way. No, no, not worse. But what, how are you going to, how do you see it like with, with the money now? I mean, at your old club, Palace, with Lombardo. I mean, why, let me ask you this then. Why, didn't, why couldn't you buy Lombardo? I never had the money at the time. I mean, well, where we, does the money all of a sudden come from? Then? No, I don't know. There's funny how chairman find it or boards of directors do find it. But I think now there's much more money coming into Sky, even when I was manager at Palace. I mean, when I was manager, we won the championship, got promoted. We bought Andy Priest from Blackpool for 110,000. We got a player on a free transfer. But, you know, Wimbledon still do it. I mean, you've only bought one player this year and you still yeah. manage it. But you, what you manage to do still is produce young players into your team. That team that played Millwall the other night when I was watching it, must have been like seven homegrown players there, perhaps eight, I don't know. You know, it's amazing how they, yeah. you know, you can still do it. And there is another route to go. Yeah. So, um, like with, at Palace, I mean, it was, what was the scenario that went on with, with Koppel? His sexual preference has got nothing to do with you. When he plays with his he plays with you. Go over there and shut up. I've had enough of it, tell you the truth. Well, you've seen the hassle on the Sunday in the pub, they don't want to pay the subs, and yet on Sunday I had an argument with them on Sunday because they all wanted to borrow out of it. You know, and... Nah. Well, they come and ask you to borrow some out, out, yeah, out, out, out of the, the funds? Yeah, out of the club funds. And it's hard because you're chasing it back all the time. You're chasing it all the time. When you ask them for it, I'll give you next week. And it's not fair on the other lads that are paying it if you're not borrowing it. You know? But, um, if they want to carry it on, they can do. It's down to them. But do you think it'll fold? Yeah. Yeah. But why have you stopped playing football? Work commitments, for one thing, and I thought the lads was getting a bit out of order and tackling people. People have got to go to work in the morning. It's all for the Sunday leagues about, in the fourth division especially, it's about just turning up on a Sunday and having a crack, crack with lads, having a good game, shaking hands and having a booze afterwards. With certain people in team, you get a lot of malice. Um, they want to kill you. They want to. They want to take you out of the game. They want to put you out of uh, out of work for weeks, which I think is wrong. A lot of people are hanging the boots up this year, so to take things from there, I don't think we'll sign anybody else on. I think we'll just call it a day. It's not enough of them, won't it now? And like, you've, you know, we've, we've only been getting 11, 12 out every week now, so you can't run a team on 12 players. No chance. So it's about right. Now it's time to uh, call it a day. The league tell, tell us this year will go up, but like we've, we've said to them now, we've had enough really, packing it in. They're getting too old and fat, some of them. <laughs> won't you miss it though, Salford Snooker? I will. Yeah, you'll miss the crack because you won't get a, a, as good a crack with any other team. I could play on a Saturday, but you know the ticket, you know, very serious. So, yeah, oh, it's very funny with them lot. Very, very funny. Very funny. Benny, these come on, Neil. Go on, my little girl. You'll bury these coming home. Go 
on the floor. Go on, little girl, get going now. Greyhounds are going to the chops. <laughs> he said, she said, all right, dog. I said, no, I said, don't you say that about my girl. I said, don't you say that about my girl. Let me tell you, I said, don't you say that about my girl. He said, she's a dog. I said, nothing, no, we both. Dead polite as well, won't you, Jay? F in this, F in that. Why you have to wait? So you went missing in the <laughs> desert in the Maldives today. Is he scoring in this too, love? <laughs> two? Yeah. Definitely going to win. Definitely. <laughs> I reckon I'll be like that. I reckon I'll be like, I'm the last race. <laughs> Watching it on the money, so. <laughs> We're getting more bird in here. Hey, you can have a sub after the next race. Katie's race. Katie's seven. Katie's boy. Katie's boy. Oh, Christ. Oh, Christ. Oh, Christ. Oh, Christ. Oh, London with everybody. In fact, we've got a real mixture here today. I've got Arsenal, Wimbledon, QPR, West Ham, Chelsea and Tottenham who all love each other. It's a miracle we've got you all sitting at the same table. Um, but I think we'll talk about cricket today then, you know, and why Jürgen Klinsmann should be playing for the England cricket team at Martin's instigation. I mean, what was it like? I mean, you loved him at Tottenham, didn't you? Yeah, I have to say Jürgen Klinsmann got me back to being like a, a schoolboy. You were like boy. a child, weren't I, you? I, I got to every game. Uh, two or three hours before kickoff to see him get out of his car, <laughs> say hello to him, and, and you know, sort of middle aged man and a friend of mine. And in actual fact, he lived uh, around this area, and, and we used to try and find out where he was booking with the local managers, where he was going to eat, and I trying to follow him around. But he was, he really time. lifted everybody, and, and I think since he went, um, Really, that the this, that was kind of the death rattle at Tottenham because he could see that they was not gonna they weren't gonna build, and I don't think he wanted to be is part. He, of I mean, is the ama amazing that I mean Zola has had that impact at Chelsea as a player. I mean, Hullet's had it as a manager, but, I yeah, mean, but Zola Hullet... as a player has has really brought yeah, yeah. world class to the team, hasn't he? Because Hullet is a, was a world class player, but, but I, I had think the he'd be same. That. I had the same when Hullet came. I mean, what Martin mm. just described. Mm. And uh, this year, you know, his ankle is better, and I'm looking forward to seeing him play again as well. And, and Zola, yeah, it's just pure magic. I'll be so gutted when he leaves, you know, when he goes back to Sardinia. But it's because he says he wants to finish off playing. For yeah, his, his and he wants to retire to his island. Yeah, but it's just pure, <laughs> pure magic for me. Yeah. You know, to see him. I mean, you know, West Ham, you've had a, you've had a, a different history with foreigners, and now you've got some English players, and even more so. I mean, that Lazaridis. An Oz, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's English-speaking. I was going to say English-speaking. Yeah, uh, I mean, you had a nightmare last year with the foreigners, and now you've got and bought some English players. With the players. exception of one, the one that we didn't want to leave was Bilic, who is a class, class yeah. player. Yeah, and, one of the best uh, central defenders. And, and uh, I mean, he, he, Manchester United would have been well to sign him. Would yeah. Have done what, that's that's the, the one player I think that uh, West Ham should have kept hold of. Uh, having said that, um, I think with Kitson and Hartson there, that, that, that was good buy. That, that, that was a good bit I mean, of at the start of the season, West Ham are the top London club. Well, if, 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 their name <laughs> was, if their name was spelt differently, we'd be at the top of the league. If, if, if it was Arsenal, if it, if it started with an A, we'd be at the top. No, uh, I, I think actually the, what West Ham have got to try and do now um, is, is get out of the mindset of being 
uh, a second division club. As, as, and by that I mean, you know, sort of second rate. West Ham, I think, with the players they've got there now, and and, and with what looks like a, a good spirit there, um, there's no reason why they shouldn't have aspirations to to aim for for, for European football. But why That's are the fans such hooligans there? Uh, personally, I mean, they speaking, really no. are just. There, there are some Idiots. horrors. There are some horrors there, but I, I think they're 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 in a minority. Do you think Paul Lynch will get the same reception coming yeah. back from Liverpool yes, as he, he got will. when he used to yes, play for Manchester will. United, which was horrific? Yes, he will. And as a West Ham supporter, I'm I'm embarrassed about that. I'm ashamed of it. I think yeah. it's, it's just out of order. But he will. I mean, I have to say that one of the the only great moment at West Ham that I've experienced, or one of the very few, apart from Eric's goal when we won there, was when <laughs> Paul Lynch got the equaliser yeah, in the two yeah, all game. Yeah. I mean that was the barracking he'd received that day was just hideous. I mean, the you know you think that racism has been you know cut out of football. Yes, Chelsea is, you have a is, very NS uh, contingent. I think you're and talking in the hideous. past there. I think you know uh, as someone who lives in Chelsea, very near to Chelsea's ground, I would say that you're wrong. Because my girlfriend's Indian and the racist crap that I have to put up with your supporters every Saturday when I'm doing my shopping is absolutely disgraceful. It's got so it's, it's got so it's got so bad that no, that even the police are now intervening and saying, look, get up, get up the road to football and leave it out. But to be fair, I, I, think, mean, it's a minority. I think the majority suffers. Majority, you know. yeah. I mean, to be fair, the only reason hooliganism at football stops and the racism has, has got less is not because fans have suddenly started to behave properly. It's because the ticket prices have gone up. Particularly and more so at Chelsea, yeah. uh, and, uh, and hooligans can't afford to go all the time. The stadiums are all seated. I think yeah. that, that's. Yeah. You know. I mean, it's a fine line, isn't it, between the passion and kind of anything goes in football between tribal rivalry, you know, yeah. Spurs, yeah. Arsenal. It's a very fine line between just being passionate and going I mean, over the top. And most Saturday most educated, yeah. but most educated ruts, people are intelligent enough to know they when know to draw the line. That's all. Line. And, right. and, and, West Ham, West Ham and I don't think you can eradicate that and, totally. And, and that's a great thing. And I think that West Ham supporters, um, through through you know in bad times, and that, that time when they played at Forest, uh, played Forest in the semi-final, yeah. and we were losing four 0 or four one, whatever it was. But but we we outsung the Forest supporters. Brian Clough clapped the West Ham supporters as he went off because made, they were behind us. It did. It did. And I thought that that was absolutely. Uh, terrific. That that's the passion. But as, as Martin said, you've got to draw the line. And I think yeah. what, anybody who starts throwing out racial abuse has got to be slung out. Yeah, but what? Ha yeah, but I was going to say on the Paul Ince thing is what ha what upset Paul uh, the West Ham fans more though was that like a couple of days or a week before he signed for Man United, he was where he was uh, he was in a Man United shirt saying, "I want to sign for Man United. West Ham won't let me go." Fair, fair we had this, we had. I mean, that's why they boo him. They don't but, not just because he's black. But, I mean, that was, I mean, it's that like, was eight I mean, years like, ago. Yeah. Some footballers make a reputation through grafting, through the sweat of their brow. Others, when they're on form, can make the game look absolutely dead easy. Artisans and artists. This man was a real football artist, Duncan McKenzie. You're looking for pretty close tab on the game then? Oh yeah, I mean I love it. I mean I could never have been a manager or a coach me. I can't believe these people that do it. You know, I hadn't, well I admire them in many respects. I think it's so, so tough um, um, for them. You know, I mean I, it just wasn't for me. I mean I, I'd much rather be on the periphery, on the outside, looking in and I'm like a big punter at heart really. Has this changed a lot since your playing days then? Eh? It hasn't, no. I mean the, the, the all the setup here is just the same. I mean, it was a very, very advanced club when I was here as a player. Um, Sir John Moore's, of course, and I suppose his money, you know, laid the foundations for all this. And uh, you know, it's a tremendous setup. It really is. You know, cars are a bit posher, though, aren't they? 
Uh, yeah, they are. I mean, it's like, well, it was only a generation for me they used to turn up on a bike, you know, and when Harry Catterick's days, I mean, probably Howard will tell you a bit later on, you know, that uh, they used to have a book outside and you have to sign in blue pen and red pen. You know, if you were late, <laughs> you were for the eye jump, you know. But uh, oh, it is, it's a bit, a bit posher, isn't it? I mean, in, in uh, oh dear, I mean, you remember that, Jimmy, my dear. You were happy to see your name on retaining list at the end of the year, weren't you? Meant but, you got another contract. Yeah, but football has always been relatively well paid in comparison with Joe Public. But these lads behind us, the ones who make it are going to be earning 10 grand a week. Do you ever envy them that? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think that's, it's, it's a fine line isn't it, between jealousy and envy. I mean, I, I think we've all fought for this and I think it's great. I mean, because they're doing well, I'm doing well. And people like me are doing well because it, there's a whole new industry. And it's not just about football today, is it? It's about the whole environment. And you look at all the people on the outside, people like me who played in the 70s, uh, and we're getting an awful lot of coverage on the on the television. They're looking back, and uh, I think it's all smashing, to be honest with you. Well, you dressed it up very well, but it means me and you don't have to have a real job. Is the main thing, isn't it? Well, out to avoid working for a living, <laughs> mate. I mean, I didn't work when I played. I'm not going to start now. <laughs> Let's talk about your playing career because I think it's fair to say you were more of an artist than an artisan. So, for the younger viewers who perhaps don't remember you in your pump. Well, yeah, I was. Um, I, I used to do daft things like nutmeg people and back heel ball over different people's heads and all that sort of thing. I did it once to Bobby Monk uh, up at Newcastle and when I got the ball between my legs, threw it over my head and over his head and he punched me straight on the chin like and he went, not, don't blame him. He said, not on my own patch and I was like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but it, it was much less stressful when we played. You know, I mean, nowadays, in fairness to the lads out here, everything's scrutinised. We were on the telly occasionally and um, not every time we kicked a ball. I mean, now everything these do is monitored by the world, isn't it? But you did dance to your own drum, Dunk. So do you ever think that counted against you? Because you were an exceptional player, but in a time when certainly at England level, they were looking to more functional players than artists. Oh, yeah. I remember Brian Glanville turning around in one TV programme. He said to Don Revy, he said, you know, Duncan McKenzie he said, yeah, he said, he's a great player. He said, but... And he never said, but what, you know, and, <laughs> I mean, I can understand that. I mean, you could turn around and say, would I have picked me? And you probably gone, no, you know, but uh, no, it was, it was a great time. I mean, I'm still full of admiration. I mean, my heroes were Frank Worthington, Tony Curry, Alan Hudson, and Stan Bowles. I mean, they were, they were all tremendous talent. But I bet they didn't get 20 England caps between them, did they? No, they didn't. No, I mean, and, you yeah, know, whether it's right or wrong, you know, I suppose... Um, you know, it, it's just immaterial really now. It's uh, we all had a good time when we played. That was the most important thing. It was it was a great it was a great period. You know, we enjoyed ourselves. Now, one of the managers you played for was a certain Brian Clough Esquire. What was that like? <laughs> it, it was all right. Now, Cloughy was totally uh, different to most people's imagination of him. It was this brash, outrageous. Child. Yeah, he could be. I mean, in many respects, I think he projected his own image to that. But, I mean, he was a pussycat if ever confronted, you know, if you ever had to go back at him. I mean, I remember when I, I just signed for Leeds and it was infamously smoking 40 fags a day at the time. And I just walked into the change room and he's went, hey, he said, smoky, you pack them fags in or get yourself another club. And I just said, that's fine, where am I going? He <laughs> went very funny and walked out. <laughs> When you get clubs like Manchester United and now Arsenal going into global with, with Nike promoting them all around the world, uh, massive internet site presences and all the rest of it, mm. these clubs are going to take money away from the smaller clubs in other, other cities. People like Manchester City have had to live in the shadow of United for years, same with Everton. Now, now it's starting to be Tottenham in London and clubs are going to not get their local support because kids well, want to support big teams. That, that, no, no, but it's true. Yeah, but the thing is, it's not an unusual thing. It happens all over the world. Yeah. Juventus yeah. have got yeah. worldwide support. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the big oh, clubs, Barcelona. Barcelona, Real Madrid, that's where the best of the Spanish yeah. players go. I mean, the, the, that's, that's supply and demand. I mean, that's just how it is. Wimbledon would rather retain all the players that they've had to sell and get money for. And if they had, well, can you imagine the team they'd have now. OK, I mean, you guys, you support here the sort of financially the, the smaller clubs. And in order to stay afloat, you've had to sell your best players, the Ferdinands, the Scales of this world to keep going. Do you think you're ever going to be able, in a position to hold on to those players? And compete with, with the bigger clubs? Can you see yourselves ever in that position? I can't see. Well, I mean, even with the the Norwegian businessmen with the, the lots of money we haven't seen yet. Um, I can't quite see us becoming that, that size of club. I mean, it does as well. But, but I mean, you couldn't money. have seen I mean, yourselves in the Premiership 20 years ago, could you? 
True, yeah. No, but, but I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, so... and football does change, doesn't it? I mean, clubs come up, come down, you know, city, down. Yeah, but now it's. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but now the game is changing. There will be an elite there few will be an elite, because there, yeah. there, there is no room. There's the money. There's not enough money to it, go around. It gets around. sucked yeah. from the, the yeah. small yeah. to go to the rich. I mean, that's yeah. how it's going to be. You need money yeah. and you need the support as well. Right. If you've got big support yeah. and you've got yeah. money, that makes you a big club. Yeah. 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 Back to what you were saying uh, earlier on, that, that we're going to get a situation where basically even the Premier League is going to become virtually redundant in yeah. a few years' time yeah. because you're going to get the big clubs the playing in the European League. The, what we've got at the moment, the European Champions League, is the pre-runner to that. And you're yeah. going to get the, the, the top four or five clubs in every country are going to be competing in that. That will be the, the, the premier competition. I mean, can you see West Ham? That's where the money. In, in that. In I, that. I, would like, I would love to think so, but I doubt it. I mean, I, but I, that I may be the thing that all the lesser clubs try to qualify to get into that. Yeah. yeah, it'll be then, a different yeah. feeder system. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the game's changed because it's all about money. I mean, I mean, yeah. the thing is, you see at QPR. I mean, at the moment we, we've got a situation where we've got a we've got a, a multi-millionaire coming, Chris Wright. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. He, he's he's saying, oh, he's going to bring money and we're going to buy players. We haven't. He hasn't actually spent any of his own money yet. I mean, a lot of uh, well, this is it. I mean, <laughs> how, has he? I mean, you know, what it, what is his we'll worth? Borrow. You know. The money that we've bought players on at the moment has come from the fans. We're buying the shares, and I mean, uh, Joe was saying here that um, Wimbledon, you know, they, this Norwegian guy, he hasn't spent any money yet. Uh, we, you know, we, we're not, haven't yet seen this money being spent by by uh, Chris yeah, Wright. And you know, job I mean, all over again. And in order, yeah, in order to get into the Premiership and stay in the Premiership, you've got to have the cash now, haven't you? Yeah, but I mean, you have to look at the club's independence. I mean, if you look, say, for example, what happened to Newcastle when Shearer got injured. That actually stopped Arsenal's board of directors floating our club. I mean, that would have been probably yeah. worth 450, maybe 500 million pounds off like Arsenal. They'd rather have the independence to run the club. They make quite a large profit, but it means that they are not going to suddenly find the club's worth half of what it was one morning because, say, would it not Ian what? Wright's got suspended or something. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but the bigger, the bigger, be, you know? the bigger, Absolutely. the bigger clubs who've had success. I mean, there was quite a big thing chat about these shares. The bigger clubs are not so dependent on results and 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 on one player. I mean, I think I think Newcastle are almost unique in that position. Shearer is pretty much unique in the British I don't game. Know. I mean, if you're Martin Edwards, I mean, you'd be pretty pissed off that you didn't get in the European Cup final because it probably cost him thirty million quid personally. Your shares would have increased by that amount. The fact is, at the end of the day, is that. Now you used to have this so-called Big Five, and now out of that Big Five, which were Arsenal, Liverpool, Manchester United, Everton, Everton, and, Everton Tottenham. and Tottenham, yeah. now Everton are, are nothing. Yeah. Tottenham are undergoing, if you like, a transitional period where they're paying I think the it's price. It's called a crisis, isn't it? Well, it's been going on yeah. for 20 well, years. <laughs> but they've not won the league for 36 years. They probably won't win it for another 10. But the fact is, is that they're still paying the price of what went on the shenanigans they had before. Yeah. 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 You yeah. Know, yeah, Arsenal's always, and, yeah, yeah. Arsenal's always had, have always had money, and so have Manchester United. Yeah. And Liverpool have always had good backing. Yeah. And those three clubs, if you like, and outside the English league, Rangers, they're probably the four richest clubs in Britain. Yeah. And oh, definitely the four I mean, richest the other, clubs. The other problem is that how long can a supporter wait nowadays for, for a success. club to turn success, it round? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing is, see, what and I we're thought putting was, the pressure but on, last, aren't we? Well, oh, supporters oh, do, because there's no time. Uh, to, to wait, you know, to say wait four or five years to a football support, you might yeah. as well hang well, yourself. We, we but, some... but I'd just like to say about what uh, I admired last year okay, about we'll Everton on this, was what Joe Royal put his hands up, did the right thing, resigned, he didn't do his job right, and now I feel Jerry Francis should have done the same thing last year. You know, got a bit honest about it and said, well, I've done my best, it hasn't worked. And, resign. So and on that note, Mr Sugar, we'll leave it there. Thanks very much, everyone, for coming. That's all we've got time for this week, but we'll be back next week for more studs. Now, coffee was totally uh, different to most people's imagination of it. It was this brash, outrageous... Ch yeah, it could be. I mean, in many respects, I think he projected his own image to that. But, I mean, he was a pussycat if ever confronted, you know, if you ever had to go back at him. I mean, I remember when I, I just signed for Leeds and... It was infamously smoking 40 fags a day at the time. And I just walked into the change room and he's going, hey, he said, Smokey, you pack them fags in or get yourself another club. And I just said, that's fine, where am I going? He went <laughs> very funny and walked out, you know. And he wouldn't carry steaming in, you know, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's sad. I mean, he's, he's, he's not been well last three or four years, you know, and I'm sure we all wish him well because it was a sad job when he never got the England manager's job in the 70s, really. I think we'd have all loved that, wouldn't we?
Well, they always say it's a fairly fine line between genius and madness. We'll paraphrase that. Slight, like, <laughs> fine line between being brilliant and balmy. Yeah. How closely did he walk that? Well, I mean, I think he would have been a captain of most industries, to be honest with you, if he'd have been in that. I mean, as I say, I think an awful lot of what he did was projected. There were not a lot of people at that time that did walk the tightrope. Uh, people like Malcolm Ellison. Who, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, that, that was one in the managerial. So I suppose the nearest one in the modern day has been a great, great character is Ron Atkinson, who you could perhaps equate to that time. And uh, But, I mean... Ron wants to survive then because he's a bit semi-sensible, isn't he? You know, I mean, you've got to be totally off the wall. When the, the players that uh, were there then, like the Frank Worthingtons and the Tony Currys, there was always some quirk. Bestie, of course, came into just it. Just a bit, just yeah. Just a bit. And, uh, you yeah, know, I mean, that's it. You never quite knew what they were going to do on or off the field. And that was what, I suppose, held the mystique about it. What about your time here, Duncan Everton? That was brilliant. I mean, the, the different class here. I mean... Uh, I mean, you must have heard this, the tales. I mean, I do the phone in here on the local radio station on, for the BBC, and uh, you want to see the, some of the things that they come out with. Uh, you know, you get a Liverpoolian ringing me up on a Saturday night after an Everton game, you know, to wind me up. He says, "Hey, Mackenzie, you, you're crap when you're playing, Sonny. You're crap on the radio." He said, "No." I said, "Well, thanks very much, Tom." He said, "It's all right, Sonny." He said, "I'm only joking." He said, "You were just crap when you played." <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, these are things you just have to learn to live with, you know. And they are. They they were never. They were never ones for being too patronising. You can play football for a lot of clubs, as I did, and uh, the punters could be patronising. Here, you don't get that. They, they love you, but they turn around and say, yeah, we love you to death, but you're stunk today, lad. <laughs> you know? But after you finished, Dunk, you made your home in the North West. Was there any particular reason for that? Um, well, I married a Liverpool girl. I suppose that's got something to do with it. But, I mean, it's, it's a great place. I mean, I think if it hadn't been a great place, we'd have moved somewhere else. But, uh, I mean, the people up here, they've got a great sense of humour. And uh, it's, it's, I think it's a lovely lifestyle. I and mean, it's nice and easy and, and relaxing. A lot of football around about as well to pick and choose from. The players that you mentioned there are of a certain kind. Fans loved them. Managers maybe had more of a question mark against it. But it was a two-edged sword. Great entertainment, great career. But you could perhaps have had more England success if you'd have conformed more. Any regrets? Um, not really, no. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's been nice to turn around and uh, play in the European Cup final with Leeds instead of being sat on the bench. Uh, it would have been nice to have played 20 times for England instead of being sat on the bench under Alf Ramsey and Joe Mercer and, uh, and, and Don Revy. But uh, I, I look back and I just think to myself, it wasn't the end of the world, you know. I mean, I know people tend to say, they often say to me, what's your favourite club? All of them. You know, I mean, I loved every minute of what I did. And I suppose if I went back, the nicest testimony I could give is that I wouldn't change anything. One of the things you were famous for, just slightly 15 degrees to the side of football, was your athletic prowess. I know. Chucking stuff like golf balls and jumping over mini cars, the old reckon you could do, could you? I could, yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually jumped when I was a kid. I actually jumped over a Mar old Mark 10 Jag. I mean, that takes some doing, wouldn't it? Which way? Lengthways? <laughs> no, 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 no. Settle down. <laughs> over the roof. Yeah, I used to, I used to do that for, for bets. And um, I mean, I never used to get paid on these bets. It was dreadful, really. Uh, it all started back at Nottingham Forest when we used to have to jump over a five-bar gate to get back to get the, the cold lemon in the summer. You know, it would be a red-hot day and you'd been running around training. And I used to say... Um, like, if you weren't in the first ten back, you wouldn't get any cold lemon because the first greedy lot would be in there and they'd have had it all drunk and they'd been out left for the stragglers. So instead of going through a five-bar, instead of not five-bar, instead of going through like a turnstile, I used to hop over this, this fence. It was about five foot high, you know, and a bit of an eye jumper at school, that type of thing. And somebody just said one day, Brian Williamson, the goalkeeper, said, he said, that's Tommy's minis, smaller than that, Tommy Cavanna that was, who of course you know very well, Jim. And... Uh, I said, yeah, I said, I'll double. So he said, go on then. So I said, yeah, I get out. So he said, yeah, well, about a fiver. Would you do it for a fiver? I said, right, and it was a week's wages. So I've gone and jumped <laughs> over it, and they never give me the money, but that's how it started. And no more was said until I went to Leeds. And uh, Cluffy signed John O'Hare and John McGovern, and John O'Hare got there, and he was talking to the Scottish lad. He says, I see you got dunk. He says, you know, he says, I can jump over cars, you know. Well, the stick I got was unbelievable. And one day I come in for training with these two from, we'd driven up from Derby. 
And there's this yellow mini that belonged to the secretary with the big bow on the top, you know, and they're all winding me up, come on, you've got to do it. So I put a tracksuit on, went and did it for them. And then they took me outside and made me throw a golf ball uh, to see that I could throw it the length of the pitch. And I threw it over the old cow shed at Leeds from behind the goal at the other end. Did you get paid for that one, though? No. Duncan, you need a manager. I you was need a manager. Des desperately, desperately poor businessman, me. You know, so I'm much better off talking to people like you. A final question for you then, if you had your chance, you said before you'd never shown the slightest interest in management or training. No. Is there nothing that would ever entice you to get a tracksuit on and work with young players? Oh no, no. I mean, great. I mean, I, the kids kids are smashing, you know, when they're that age, you know, when they're eight, nine, ten, and you can have a laugh and a joke and one thing. But it's, it's, it's very difficult, it's very difficult, and I think it needs a special kind of ability um, and a special kind of person to be a coach and to be a manager. It, wasn't me. I know lots of the lads do it, but then good luck to them, you know. And Ross planting the high one. He's nodded down by Gregory, I think. Dobson couldn't get to it. Mackenzie does! The back pass is punished. During the week, he's a headmaster, but at the weekend, he's the Premiership's man in black. It is, of course, David Ellery. <laughs> David, being a headmaster and a referee, how similar are the roles? Well, they both involve dealing with people and trying to create a situation where those with skills and abilities can express them and are protected from those who perhaps don't want them to express them. So you're dealing with people all the time and, and they're very similar roles, I think. What made you become a referee? Well, frankly, I wasn't a particularly good player when I was at school and, and refereeing gave me a chance to remain actively involved in the game rather than passively watching the game. Did you want game. to be a player at the beginning? Yes, I think I'd like to be, but I found that I, I didn't have the skills necessary. I was a second team player rather than the first team player and um, was going to get nowhere as a player, so tried refereeing. How involved is the referee these days? Because I know years ago you would turn up for a game, referee the game and then go away, but now you're a lot more involved. How has it changed? I think football's become more professional everywhere and that includes referees and we now spend much more time training, we spend much more time studying videos, going to meetings, trying to make sure we referee as well as we possibly can, plus being the focus of the media attention which is, which is huge for all the Premier League referees these days, so it takes much, much more time. Have you ever booked Vinny on the pitch? I'm afraid I have quite a lot of times and, and uh, sent him off once. Uh, he's a man with a hard reputation and, and part of his reputation has come from his battles with referees. But I have to say, for the last two years, I've not given him a red or yellow card. So <laughs> either he's getting softer or I am or, or both. Still time. <laughs> Still time, yes. When you have situations like that, when you have to book anyone, do the players ever hold a grudge against it at all? Not generally, I, I don't think. I mean, I think there are some players who like some referees and don't like other referees and sometimes it may be because they feel they've been booked or sent off unfairly or it may just be a personality clash, some you get on with very well, some not so well. That's, that's true of all aspects of life. I think. When you have situations like with David Beckham where the fans were chanting against him, how do you handle that? How do you calm down a player? In that situation. Well, I think a referee has a responsibility to try to make sure that the players don't misbehave, and that's not just on the field, but, but off the field situations as well. And I was simply saying to him that the fans weren't worth getting worried about, and, and really all that was going to happen was that if he reacted, he'd find himself getting into trouble, and, and he was sort of big enough and ugly enough to, to ignore them, as it were. And uh, he seemed to take the advice in good part, and one was able to prevent a situation happening rather than having to deal with a problem once it had occurred. Mm -hmm. There's been quite a lot of rule changes over the past few years. Do you think they're for the good? I think by and large they are. There was great concern at the start of the season, this new law change where goalkeepers could only hold the ball for five seconds was going to cause difficulties, but in fact it's speeded up the flow of the game and like many of the others, I think it's producing better, faster, more exciting football. What does the future hold for referees? Can you ever see it where we'll have two on a pitch at any time? I don't think so really. We have one referee and two assistants now, so we have three people controlling the game. I think there's a greater chance that technology will in some ways come in and, and assist referees one way or the other rather than having two referees. And finally, do you still enjoy it? Very much so, very much so. There's a huge buzz when you walk out into the great stadia, which are the Premier League, and, and, and a fantastic time. I think once I stop enjoying it, I'll leave it. So, um, 
like with at Palace, I mean, it was what was the scenario that went on with with Koppel, like? I mean, what I try, what I want to want to know is, you know, like when you get sacked. I mean, yeah. do, you, is, do you think like that's the end of the world? It, you know, you've yes. you curse <laughs> and swear and everything, but Koppel yeah. had that, and then he, he he came back, didn't he? Yeah, you know, that was amazing, really. He went into that short period at Manchester City. But I think he had always lived in the area. He still spent a lot of time going around the training ground. And when I was at the club, you know, he was still, you know, he would go to games quite frequently. And therefore, when a vacancy comes, if you're around the ground enough, that's the first name to come to. But when you do get the, the sack, and I've had it twice now, it hurts, you know, there's no doubt it, it ages you what a little What do you do, bit. just shut the door and... Yeah, basically, I think you shut the door, you know, you get your mates round, you get your friends round, you go for a few beers, you get uh, drunk, you, you know, hopefully your wife consoles you a little bit, but it, it's quite hurtful. She must you know. like it because she spends a little t bit of time at home. Yeah, she does. Well, I don't know if she does like it. She's now moaning I'm spending too much time at home and there's no pleasing them. You know, I've probably had 22 years where she's saying you're never in, where are you? And now I'm going through a period in my life where she wants to get me out of her feet. But it's, it is problems. Like, I used to stop off for a drink coming on the way home and, you know, have a couple of pints with my mates. Now yeah. I have to check to go out the house, so it does cause certain social problems. Yeah, but what um, you know, like when supporters, like it happens with players. You get to say a player goes up to, I don't know, like Barnby said, oh, I want to get back up north when he was down here up to him. So he goes, and then he goes up there and he says, oh, I want to go, you know, or, or or moves down the road or something. The supporters must think, you know. What's, what's he doing that for? Like when Coppel went to Man City, they mm. said, oh, the pressure's too much for me. You've got to get out. Next minute, he takes over at Palace again. Yeah, well, I mean, that's like, you've got to say, it's a weird sort of double standard. Do you think it, he but... took that job and then went, oh, no. I, I, I think he took that job and then Manchester, you know, compared with London, you can't lose yourself. And I think there he was having to do things he didn't want to do, probably do presentations, all the other things you have to do as a manager. Yeah. And I think with Ferguson up there and the clash, it was, you know, probably just a little bit too much. He likes the quieter life, he can lose himself in London. But, you know, I, I think players, you know, it's no great hardship. I mean, staying at one club for a long time and I think... You know, when they say, well, the pressures and this, there's pressures in everybody's walk of life. There's pressures yeah. for the average man in the street today. If he's oh, only yeah. 14,000 a year, he's got three kids, it's pressures. I don't think we yeah. ought to get too carried away with that. But you've done another job, you know, so I think probably you'll accept that. You know, you, you're glad to be pleased to be a footballer. It's not sitting in a dentist chair every day. You've done it? another job. Yeah, I've done another job. And, I, you know, I really still come back to the fact that the biggest thing I still enjoyed doing was football. And I was always, I never found going into the training ground hard work, Benny. I've got to say that I enjoyed it. I liked the crack. If the lads wanted to have a little yeah. bit of Mickey taking with me, I loved it. It kept me going. And it's probably one of the biggest things that I miss now is that day to day going in and, and having the crack with, with the players. And how, how would, like now, I think, like, Hullet would say at Chelsea to Colin Hutchinson, right, I want, a, I want him. You do the way, doesn't it? Could you sit down, say, with Lombardo and, and, uh, and if he sat in front of you and said, oh, I want 30 or 40 grand a week, I want my own butler, I want this, I want that. Well, how do you deal with that now? Do you just, like, would you let someone get on it? You I know think, what I'm saying? If you had a, say you as manager, say Chelsea or Palace. Yeah, I think I probably would because I think it's What, well, you don't want that to do? No, that. I think it's very difficult for you to train the player and coach him and then tell him he's not as worth as much as he uh, thinks he is. I mean, I, you know, is it is a player a problem. worth 40 grand a week? No, that's the truth of it. I don't, I don't begrudge it to him, but I don't. No, begrudge, I don't and I do think it causes problems in the changing room, don't you? A little bit. I think you know, it, when the gap is that big. You well, know, even at Middlesbrough, it was creeping in, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. You know what I mean? You could see, you know, we're a long way away, but you could see the signs there. Yeah. You know, and then when players were leaving or something like that, first thing they say, well, he, all that dough he was on, like, yeah. you know. And there was us doing the same job. Did you have that problem at Leeds, as a matter of interest, or not? No, because we were basically all on the same dough, really. Yeah. At Leeds, yeah. It was, you know, I mean, is that the answer? Is, is it the answer to say, you know, no, you've got to cap it? I mean, I how does a manager feel that a player's on more money than that? I don't know. I mean, when I was at Palace, I mean, you know, like my, my salary was quite low because I was a new manager, but I didn't really mind. I wanted to do it. It never. And I think if you're a coach, really, you want the best for your players. You know, you don't want to hold them back. I never worried about the money side. I thought, I don't think you should cap the salaries. I'm a great believer in you know, freedom for everybody to get as much as they can. And if you can get a little bit more somewhere else, good luck to you. And if, I, I don't think to start capping it is, is really the answer. Yeah. You've got to have a free marketplace in a way. And if the clubs will play for it, you know, I do think we're going to go through a situation that some of the clubs are going to go bust, especially in the nationwide division, Vinny, because they're still paying out big money in that as well. Yeah, there is some big money knocking about, yeah.
But so, what are you doing now then? You'll just. I do some work, you know, I do my sort of TB work, I do some work for the Football Association, you know, I try and keep involved in my coaching as much as I can because really that's what I enjoy doing, I enjoy the coaching side of it, you know, when I was first at Wimbledon that was probably what I did best when I ran the youth team at Palace and the reserve team, I enjoyed working with the players and I think I've got to the age in my life where I'd prefer to do something I'm enjoying doing rather than saying, well I want to be top of the tree and I want the, want the money, I get a big buzz as I say through the through the players coming through, whether they came from non-league or they came from the youth team, uh, was a good thing. So if anybody wants a, wants a coach, there's your man, and I'm going to ask him in a minute if I can have a swim in his pool. Get up with him, Brian! Get clean it! We always started it off and we always said it would be for fun. No matter if we finished last, top, in the middle, we always said it would be, you know, we'd have a good laugh out of it, good crack, and I think that's what we've had. Out of it. At the end of the at the end of the day. The last game of the season and the last ever game for Salford Snooker. Regardless of the result, they were guaranteed fourth place in Division Four. Keep quiet. How can you keep quiet like you got a chance on goal? How can you keep quiet? And the end of an era as well. Finished. Finished. Well, referee spoke like that, don't we? How can you play with duck eggs like him? <laughs> I only got booked. <laughs> you should have got sent off twice. Had a good crack, didn't we? Had a good laugh. So it's all right, I'm not bothered now. Had a good laugh. Had a good season. Yeah, finish, <laughs> finished up there. That's it for this week. Join me next week for even more fantastic football. Do what you want this week, but don't miss the Vinnie Jones Show.